And the last thing is a scientific mission. So A3 and A3 CubeSnap stands for Acquire, Analyze, and Apply. This year was all about acquiring. It was all about learning about the engineering process, learning how to organize a team, and finding a way for our team to actually build this CubeSnap. I'm at a local brewery in the city of Aurora, watching a special presentation by a group of four high school students from DSST Public Schools, a consortium of free charter schools with a strong focus on STEM education. They've been working on a multi-year project to build a miniature satellite about the size of a Rubik's Cube called a CubeSat. Next year, we want to use a hypothesis, a scientific mission, to contribute to science and apply our data to a tangible thing that we can analyze. Maybe we'll help understand the stratosphere. Maybe we'll help our community understand our air quality. Something like that to actually apply the data that we learn about. The students were in this room full of aerospace geeks drinking beer to get advice and mentorship. This program is about giving students exposure to real-world problems and experiences before they continue on to college. My name is Caleb Oldemichael. I'm a rising senior at DSST Montview High School. My name is Brandon Lee. Uh, I'll be leading the program with Caleb next year, and I was part of the co-team. My name is Hanok Delahun. I am a rising freshman at Stanford, and I was the lead mentor and soldering technician for the team. My name is Hanok Mahari, and I'll be attending CU Boulder in the fall of 2023, and I was the lead mentor for the CAD group. Okay, so who wants to describe CubeSat to their grandma for me? Um, so, Grandma, we make these 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter uh, boxes and they have technology in them. So, and then we put them on a balloon and we send them up to the stratosphere and they collect data for us and we can use that data in the future. This year we collected data on an altimeter. So that was humidity, that was temperature, that was our altitude, things like that. In the future, we hope that we'll be able to use our data in a scientific manner. Uh, we'll come up with a hypothesis as a team for next year. But an example would be trying to better understand the stratosphere in Colorado, maybe trying to better understand our air quality, being able to relate to our school and our community what we've learned about the stratosphere. For next year, if we want to send up multiple CubeSats at different times, maybe different months, different seasons, different weather conditions, we can measure how maybe rain affects our ozone or something like that to really better understand the complicated things up there that we don't interact with every day. What struck me when talking with the students was how clearly invested they were, not only in the learning aspect of the project, but how they wanted to help their community. Seeing young people already engaged, not ignoring the complex, sometimes overwhelming issues of today, feels like an antidote to the indifference that can easily seep into our thinking. It's very important to us to be able to use our data for something. Let's say that our community wants to know how a certain weather condition will affect people playing outside, for example. We could help with that. That's just an example of something tangible that we could do with our data. What our CubeSat Club did is just a little sneak peek of what our next generation and what students can do. What they say is we are the future, right? So I feel like giving us access, giving us opportunity, and giving us connections to those industry leads and giving us that opportunity will be able to um, really impact the workforce. It just basically starts with trust. This program, we had a lot of people support us, but at the same time, the big thing to remember is that we did the work. We just had the people on our outside to support us, giving us the trust to actually do it. To add on to what Henock said, if you can't really trust the next generation, then you can't really expect them to be able to take on all these like gigantic problems that are facing the earth. The wisdom these young people have is inspiring. It gives me hope that as complicated, as troubling, as wrought as these problems are, there is a next generation of wickedly smart and engaged people eager to make the world better. The students asked us to trust them, the next generation. We need to do that. And we need to start today with each other we need to believe that we can solve these problems and that we can work together. In this, our last episode, we'll examine what it really means to empower people. And what does it mean to appreciate both how far we've come and how far we still have to go? My name is Kristen Uhlenbrock, 
And from the Institute for Science and Policy, this is Clearing the Air, the hazy future of our skies. A series about the state of air in Colorado and how we are navigating this complex problem that knows no borders. Researchers have truly now appreciated that they need to do responsive work. They need to do responsive research. They need to work with the community. The community has experiences. They have expertise. To be truthful, that's often something in our universities we have not acknowledged, that people in community have expertise. They know their lives better than us as a researcher does. This is Dr. Lisa Secuto. We met her back in episode one. She is the Director of Community Outreach and Research at National Jewish Health and a professor at CU Anschutz. Researchers need to be able to speak in plain English and understand the concerns of community so that they can be responsive and that part of their mandate and their responsibility is to be responsive to community. The other thing that's important is understanding the importance of relationships and trust. And that doesn't happen right away. And sadly, researchers can be what we call helicopters and that they come into a community, often an environmental justice community, and they collect their data. They're pulling from the community and not sharing the data with them, not giving them ownership, not helping them in terms of how to solve issues, what to do. And they just take their data and helicopter out. And so as a result, a lot of communities don't trust researchers, and rightfully so. There is a role for everyone in rethinking what it means to do meaningful engagement and how some practices of the past don't serve the people of today. Researchers, like everyone else in this series, have a role to play too. That's why Lisa dedicates her time to making connections. I love being the date maker in terms of bringing the researchers and community members together and helping community members organize their thoughts so that they can do research speak. If we can get on the same page, we could do so much more. Too often, research findings are published in some academic journal that only other scientists read, while the community remains in the dark about what's going on. But Lisa has started to see that change. Our systems are changing so that we are more rewarded, not for just publishing papers, But for what we're doing in community, how our research is being translated and the uptake in community. Lisa's knowledge and experience come from spending time in communities, from North Denver to the San Luis Valley, having conversations and doing a lot of listening. And more conversations and more listening. One of her major takeaways is that words matter. What we learned in that process is that no one understands the air quality index. How can we simplify that? And then when we also talk about vulnerable and sensitive groups, that was quite inflammatory to people and that they don't see themselves that they thought it was very derogatory, that they were weak. They told us that they preferred at risk. We have different risk levels and it changes, but we are all at risk. It's not that those are overly sensitive groups or the more vulnerable groups. What Lisa's talking about and doing is a longer term, more engaged, immersive process that involves direct collaboration with community members. It's called community science. And it's not about a researcher coming in to tell people what the problem is or what to do but trusting and using a community's experience and knowledge. I, along with a lot of my teammates and residents in Globe Area Swansea and Groundworks Denver, did a project in Globe Area Swansea where families had air quality monitors. And they actually looked indoors as well as outdoors. So they wore monitors for three days. And they did that four times over the year. They started to appreciate the power that a monitor would give them. They started to understand the power of the data and how they could interpret the data 
and then how they could change their behavior. They then became their own explorers, researchers. They then would start to talking to us and have questions. Lisa, is it really bad at this park that I go to where my son plays soccer? I said, I don't know. Take the monitor. Wear your monitor. It was great because they were then posing questions. They could use air quality monitors to get the answers that they wanted. We could support interpretation, but after really, they kind of got the hang of it. They just took off with it. Learning from community members and seeing how awareness and empowerment drive people to take action for themselves gives Lisa hope for the future. We're seeing more and more people come up and want to be the change agents and are pushing us. People in our community are saying this is important to us. Rural communities that didn't have any air quality data, they have been buying their own air quality monitors and talking to the EPA saying, we need this information, we need these data. So now we have air now. So people are able to buy their own monitors and some that they have through public health, through libraries, they can rent their own air quality monitors. So people are able to join in the conversation, are understanding it and are pushing us to understand the bigger picture more insightfully and in a more engaging way. Well, welcome to our ozone garden. <laughs> it's very small, but it's really full now. It's taken about two years for it to get as full as it is now. I'm in Bennett, Colorado, a small town of less than 3,000 people on the plains east of Denver. I'm walking around the Anything Bennett Library branch with Molly DeWolf, one of the librarians, and Brian Halavasik, who serves as the environmental health director for the Adams County Health but Department. Yeah, we, um got a grant from the Love My Air initiative through Adams County to um, build the garden from the ground up. The garden box itself and all of the plants were all from a grant. We've got the milkweed and the snap beans. Both are plants that were given to us through the um, National Center for Atmospheric Research. I'm so glad I said that well. Um, <laughs> um, so we've got ozone sensitive snap beans and ozone tolerant snap beans to see the difference between the two. So when kids come or when families come to see it, they can compare the two plants and see what is being damaged and what isn't, which is pretty cool. People who visit the library can fill out worksheets from the National Center for Atmospheric Research, or NCAR, with their observations of how the plants are growing or looking recording the telltale signs of ozone damage. Ground level ozone is invisible and a component that forms smog. And it affects the health of both animals, and that means humans too, and plants. Ozone can impact a plant's ability to grow or produce food or make it susceptible to disease. And while all plants aren't at risk from ozone pollution, some are and you can easily see it on their leaves. For example, milkweed can get dark polka dots, or ponderosa pine needles can turn brown. But some, like the beautiful quaking aspen trees, don't have the same type of visible impact. They just start to die. Along with the garden, the library has an air quality monitor that feeds data to the Love My Air website and app, where anyone can see the readings. Here's Brian with the county. That device that's attached to the light pole there is a solar powered sensor that measures PM 2.5 or particulate matter 2.5, so very small. So that, that collects the data and then it ultimately displays that data on a dashboard that can be viewed real time. We've got 20 of those different sensors through the Adams County Love My Air program across Adams County and, and Arapahoe County and about eight different partners that work with us. The library also has a collection of personal-sized air quality monitors. 
customers can check out and take home and use them. And I, that's what I have in my hands here. They're just little air quality sensors. This one is has a lovely um, screen that you can see really easily what your air quality inside and outdoors is like in your home. So you can take this, check it out from the library, take it home, use it for three weeks, collect data on your own air quality and what you can do to, to fix it if it's bad. The cool thing about an ozone garden is that it can serve as a sort of billboard that sparks people's interests. We do have a lot of customers that come and are surprised that we have a milkweed garden. <laughs> and so it causes a lot of really great discussion. We talk about why it's there and, and what it's for and then show them ways to collect data themselves. Most people want to have an ozone garden themselves once they see it and want to know how to do it. And so that's a really lovely conversation I have with people. And anyone can grow a, an ozone garden and register it on the website and be part of the whole scientific process. And so we like to show them how to do that as well. I wasn't aware of air quality and the science behind it, but now I know all about PM 2.5 and, <laughs> and all of those things, and I can share that with our community. I've done some programming with the Ozone Garden, teaching them how to collect data, what it actually means, how to spot ozone damage on plants, and what plants will show it and what plants won't, things like that. And then we come out and we collect data together. Don't you just love libraries? Whether it's a small town like Bennett or a major metropolitan area, libraries often serve as a much needed bridge. In this case, it's a bridge between Adams County Health Department and the local community. When we started the Love My Air program was in the fall of 2019, so right before COVID. And Denver, is it was program is really centered around schools, and so we were replicating that, but then COVID hit. And it was very hard to really engage schools at that time on this topic because they had so many other things to deal with. So we kind of had to shift. We pulled in Anythink. We pulled in the Rapaho libraries. We started working with Thornton Parks and Rec, various cities, North Glen, Sheridan, Inglewood. When they reached out to us, it was pretty much a cold call to the library to see if we could be a part of it. And we jumped on the chance because it's a mutual benefit for both of us. We do a lot of education and programming around air quality because of the initiative and because of the grants that we were awarded, which is great. The community out here, they're pretty concerned about air quality. And being out here, our air is a lot different than in the city. It likes to settle and sit for a while. Either that or it's super windy. Just yesterday, I looked at the website and looked at our monitor, and it was green and then red and then green again just within, like, three hours. And you can look at minute to minute what the air quality looks like. So it does spike throughout the day and throughout the week. And sometimes it's better and sometimes it's really bad. People out here are real sensitive to that because there's nothing to block it. <laughs> there are no trees <laughs> or anything else. So a lot of people out here are concerned and this is just a way to help them N know more about it. Sometimes it's just the little things that might grow awareness like turning people's fascination with plants into curiosity about air pollution. I love our ozone garden. I think it's beautiful and, and it's fascinating how you can physically see where ozone, like you can see the ozone damage, like just in on these beautiful plants that we have. Um, and so it's science right in front of you which is so fascinating and so wonderful. And I wish more people did ask about it. Like with most things, who pays attention matters. And for Brian, community education is the ground level for change. I think the more awareness we can raise around sources of pollution and unhealthy levels of particulate matter and ozone, like the ozone garden, continuing to build that awareness and then hopefully lead towards individual behavior change and lead towards systematic changes and policy changes and hopefully as we keep doing this, improving air quality and policies that will improve public health and air quality. Stop a stranger on the street and ask them about air quality, and you'll likely get mixed responses, plus maybe a few weird looks. The reality is, air quality isn't broadly understood by most of us. 
It's a complex topic that takes some work to break down into bite-sized pieces. And not everyone has the time or interest. But programs like Love My Air and projects like Bennett's Ozone Garden and hopefully this podcast will make air quality more accessible and intuitive for those of us who wouldn't think twice about what's in our air. It's fun to go back and look at the old annual reports to the public that were written largely on typewriters with hand-drawn graphs and also some art from some folks from back in the 70s. I actually have all of them in hard copy. This is Jeremy Newstifter, the Director of Policy for the Air Pollution Control Division at CDPHE. But to see the air quality back then from a monitoring standpoint versus what the air quality is now, we have very few low-hanging fruit like they did back then to see significant improvements. But the fact that we're seeing any improvement at all is really exciting to me. And, you know, I don't have kids, but I love my cousins and all my friends' kids, and a lot of them have asthma. Um, I just hope that we can live in a world where you don't have to worry about going outside for recess. Jeremy remembers when Michael Ogletree took the reins a few years ago. When Michael came in, there was like fear of, it's a new director, you never know what's going to happen. He faced significant challenges early on, having to hire a lot of new high-level managers. It's an absolute cultural shift within the division, very much humanizing the people. And this was all occurring, you know, in the middle of a pandemic when we couldn't even meet in person. But it's been a huge transformation, all for the better. And all of a sudden we have all these new programs, we have these new resources. The very first piece of federal legislation dedicating funding for research into air pollution was passed in 1955. And while there were significant policies in the years following, it wasn't really until the 90s that things kicked into high gear. And the biggest flurry of legislation and regulation in Colorado has been in the past decade. Between 2020 and 2023, Jeremy says that about nine new rules have passed each year. Here's Michael talking about some of the major ones. We're going to come back to order. Yeah, so in 2011, we passed uh, Regional Haze, the first round of that. So that included statewide requirements to significantly reduce NOx, PM, and SO2 emissions from large emitters, those being primarily coal-fired power plants and cement plants. Yeah, sure. (laughs) In Regional Hayes Round 2 in 2020, it solidified enforceable retirement dates for nearly all coal-fired power plants in the state. Excellent. Landmark oil and gas regulations, which was building on the 2004 and 2008 requirements. First in the nation, leak detection and repair requirements for upstream facilities that had been expanded upon in recent years and emulated by other states at the EPA. Sure, I may have to phone a friend to get the exact details on on that. Um, The Air Quality Control Commission required this racked analysis and implementation on all major sources of VOCs and NOx in the non-attainment area. It includes everything from large breweries to cement plants to aluminum can manufacturers to oil and gas facilities. I have now um, phoned a friend, Ronnie Kumar. In 2019, you know, at the direction of our, our Governor Polis, we adopted the Colorado Zero Emissions Vehicles rules, which required a certain percentage of all the new vehicles from sales in Colorado be zero emitting. This Colorado low emissions uh, automobile regulations were updated in 2021 to reflect the current California requirements. Colorado is really the first non-coastal state to adopt these regulations that are, are more stringent and more protective. Yes, that is correct. In 2019, SB 19-181 was passed, which is titled the Concerning Additional Public Welfare Protections Regarding Oil and Gas. That required the AQCC to update the LDAR frequencies, the leak detection and repair, to be more frequent with an extra emphasis on facilities in relative close proximity to occupied areas. I I believe this is right. I may need to verify later. The first rulemaking that I was a part of as a commissioner was in September of 2020. And that one was requiring pre-production, continuous monitoring, and reporting requirements for upstream oil and gas facilities. Thank you. I, I just was trying to understand it. That's helpful. Now I get it. The passage of the air toxics bill, that was something that 
required significant additional change in the way we do our work, kind of integrating some of the latest and greatest technology. Thank you so much for that very thorough and quickly worded uh, presentation. We will open up for questions from commissioners and we will plan to eat lunch when we're done with this. So my <laughs>
their future lives. So it's something that I think about when I think about the work that that we do here at the division. It's just unfortunate that we're still living in an era where kids in particular are being disproportionately affected by air pollution. Jeremy Newstifter. So there's always something more to do in the future. And frankly, if we do our jobs properly, we won't need to do this work anymore. I don't see that happening in, in my career, but it would be wonderful if we didn't have to have a, a large air pollution control agency. I always say where the problem is, is where the solution lies. That would be us. We are the solution, the people. This is Lucy Molina, whom we met in episode three. And she has seen progress inch forward since she first started advocating for her community in Commerce City. I feel positive now. I think the first couple years, the first year, let's just say that people were very like thinking I was crazy. Like I think through persistence, canvassing, doing the stories, doing op-eds, being persistent. It's like really uh, sharing the truth, exposing the truth has allowed my neighbors to open up. I think they've been more receptive now. Like now they're like, oh yeah, Lucy, you're right. I, I think my neighbors are being more aware. They're starting to step it up. They've joined me actually in sending letters to the EPA, to CDPHE. I have a lot of volunteers that have come to knock doors with me here. Now we have hope that accountability, right, that justice can be served. Lucy and many others think that the momentum came in 2019 with the passing of Colorado Senate Bill 181. That gave me hope. That showed that, well, Colorado's heading the right direction. The bill was a major overhaul of the regulation of the oil and gas industry and put a focus on the impacts to public health, safety, welfare, and the environment. Fast forward to 2023, and the Colorado General Assembly introduced a divisive ozone bill. It passed after being overhauled during the legislative session to remove many of the original changes in regulations. The big thing that came out of it was the creation of an interim committee to further study the issue and listen to stakeholders. The ozone bill that we went through, it was watered down like crap, but well, at least it's knocking on the door. That's what I mean. It's like the door's not open yet, but we're knocking on the door. I call them baby steps because a lot of the things could have been stopped 30 years ago. If we would have done the right thing 30 years ago, perhaps, this country would be leading the world in, in the climate crisis. But instead, we chose to make money, right? Capitalize from the injustices. Still, those baby steps give Lucy a sense of hope for the future. Hope is all we have, girl. Really, I, I think as a community, as a humanity, we can never lose hope with anything. But as I mentioned, in Colorado, those little baby steps of laws that they have given us have let me see a little bit of the light at the end of the tunnel. And this hope is what drives her forward, motivating Lucy to continue pushing for change. I don't think it's right really to know what I know now and walk away and not look back. I, I don't wanna be like that. I'm gonna continue fighting till my last breath, literally, <laughs> till my last breath. Bad air affects us all, no matter where we live. But the burden is not equal, and no one should be complacent about that. Figuring out the balance between the benefits and trade-offs of potential solutions is far from easy. That's why we need everyone, from communities, to government, to scientists, to industries, all of us working together to truly create meaningful and lasting change. Because it's a logical fallacy that we must choose between our economy, our health, and our environment. This story doesn't end here. Whether it's what's happening in our own backyard of Colorado, 
or in a faraway country, people are motivated to help solve this wicked problem. I heard this time and time again in listening to people's stories, research, and dedication. And if we all spend a little more time listening to each other, I believe that leads us to care about everyone's well-being. And that gives me hope. Because our air, it's often invisible. So it can be easy to ignore. That's our human nature. But as we gain knowledge, it just might be harder to look away. Laws of Notion is a production of the Institute for Science and Policy at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. To learn more about this season, visit clearingtheair.org. I'm your host, Kristen Uhlenbrock. This episode was written by me and Meredith Sell, produced by Trisha Waddell, with support from Nicole Delaney and fact-checking by Kate Long. Sound design by Seth Samuel, with tracks from Epidemic Sounds, and audio support by Jesse Boynton. For a full list of credits, check out the show notes. If you have learned something new, please rate, review, and share the podcast. Thank you for listening, and thank you to everyone who is part of this story. I hope you stay tuned for bonus content on this topic.